Uh, welcome to lecture nine, uh, the third mood disorders lecture on bipolar spectrum disorders and suicide prevention. So this lecture was originally supposed to um, be for the class on Tuesday the 15th, um, but because of the hurricane, everything has been shifted back a week on the syllabus. So this lecture is going to be covered in class on Tuesday the 22nd, and then on Tuesday, or Thursday the 24th, we'll cover um, the psychotic spectrum disorders. Okay. So let's jump right in. Okay. So today we're just going to be focusing on two topics, um, although there's kind of a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we'll be talking about the bipolar spectrum of mood disorders, and we'll be talking about suicide and suicide prevention. And for that part of the lecture, we'll have a guest conversation with Dr. Smith, who is a professor in our department. Okay, so the bipolar spectrum disorders that we'll be covering today are bipolar disorders one and two and cyclothymia. We're also going to be talking about disruptive mood dysregulation disorders today, but it's important to point out that it's actually not considered a bipolar spectrum disorder. It's a unipolar disorder, and it's considered to be on the depressed end of the spectrum, not the manic end. So this is just a review from lecture six. Yeah, lecture six, um, the first mood disorder lecture. These are the overall systems that are affected by mood disorders. So in the last two lectures, we talked a lot about what's affected by depression. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the mood, sleep, appetite, energy, so circadian, um, cognitive and motivational um, psychological symptoms of mania. Okay, so the main distinguishing factor of the bipolar spectrum disorders is the presence of mania or hypomania. And the only difference between mania and hypomania really is severity. So they have all overlapping symptoms. Um, technically, to meet criteria for a manic episode, you have to have symptoms longer, so at least seven days, whereas to meet criteria for a hypomanic episode, you only need to have symptoms for four days. But other than that, the number of symptoms that you need to have, the specific symptoms that cause you to meet criteria are exactly the same. So when someone is having a manic or a hypomanic episode, they might be experiencing inflated self-esteem or grandiosity. Grandiosity is just um, a distorted perception of how important you are or how special you are um, that's linked to mania. People who are having a manic or hypomanic episode have a decreased need for sleep where they might feel rested after only sleeping three or four hours. And like we said before, this is different than insomnia that's characteristic of depression. People with hypomania don't feel tired. They're not trying to sleep. They fall asleep and then wake up three hours later feeling totally refreshed. People who are manic um, are more talkative than usual. They sometimes demonstrate pressured speech, which is basically an observable behavior where someone is talking so fast that it's hard for them to get the words out. They might get breathless. They might have run on sentences or having words kind of smushed and run together. Um, so that's what an observer would see when they're talking, but what they're experiencing in their head could be racing thoughts or a flight of ideas, which is basically having a lot of um, thoughts all at once. So lots of ideas that you find really exciting, lots of different avenues that your mind pursues happening really quickly. So naturally, um, people having a manic episode also might be distractible. Um, they might be distracted by their own thoughts, or they might be just distracted by things in their environment, having trouble focusing. When someone is manic or hypomanic, they might engage in increased goal-directed activities. And this can be related to their job. It can be related to their artistic interests. It can be related to their hobbies, like shopping or collecting art. Um, it can sometimes be sexual or social, so it can include hypersexuality or um, doing a lot of activities with friends or trying to make new friends. Um, or rather than sort of intentional goal-directed activities, someone might have a lot of unintentional, non-goal-directed, meaningless activities, so psychomotor agitation, where someone's not doing anything per se, but they always feel like they have to be moving. They feel like they have this energy in their body that they have to discharge by moving. Um, and then uh, the, the last distinguishing symptom of mania or hypomania is excessive involvement in risky activities. So this could be a sudden increase in interest in something like gambling, wanting to go skydiving, uh, driving recklessly, drunk driving, um, riding your bike really fast or riding without a helmet. Um, basically just sort of feeling fearless or being more willing to take risks in your life. So the real distinguishing difference between mania and hypomania is impairment. 
So to meet criteria for a manic episode, you have to have three or four of these symptoms, um, these behaviors or experiences, plus those behaviors have to cause some kind of impairment or um, it requires hospitalization. So, oh, or psychotic features. And so a hypomanic episode doesn't have any of those things. Hypomania is not impairing, it's not distressing, it's notice noticeable to other people. So both mania and hypomania are clear um, deviations from a person's normal mood and functioning, and anyone who knows them would notice that something is different. Um, but with mania, people who know them would notice that something was different and be scared and worried for them enough that people who are manic are often hospitalized against their will. Um, or sometimes people with mania get into accidents because of their reckless behavior or they overdose because of their increase in goal-directed activity and lots of like impulsivity and social engagement that can lead to substance use. Um, or someone who's manic could, be, could become suicidal um, or they could have psychotic features. And all of those things are distinguishing features from hypomania, which is all the same behaviors, but just to a lesser degree and not impairing. So this is the first of a couple of videos of um, people's first person perspectives on what it's like to be manic, to have the symptoms of mania. Could you give me a general explanation of what it's like to be manic, both the positive and the negative sides? Uh, well, generally speaking, when I'm manic, I'm very energetic, I'm excited, I'm busy, I'm doing lots of stuff, which is the positive side because I get a lot done. Um, the downside is that I can spread myself too thin and actually overtire myself, and that leads to a, a downside in terms of the spiral depression. When I go into a fit of mania, I can be the most productive person ever. I'll get a million genius ideas. In a few seconds, unfortunately, I rarely follow through with them. Um, but on the same token, I can get a lot accomplished if I stay on the high. Like, I'll make a big long list of things to do, like clean the house, go do some extensive workout, paint all my walls, and I'll do it all. I'll stay till the wee hours of the morning to get it done as long as I stay on the high. But as soon as a flip and I can be in the middle of and I can crash. When I'm manic, I turn into everyone's best friend. I'm very friendly. I'm very happy. We're very funny. You feel really euphoric. You think there's nothing that you can't do. And the further it goes into it, the less sleep that you get, the less that you're actually able to find my you view. When you're so high, so to speak, and hyped up, you don't notice that you're not getting things done. And then the thoughts that you're thinking bounce in and out so fast that you can't keep track of them. And so my uh, my parents and brothers and sisters and things like that, they were noticing what was going on. Of course, I wasn't. I was thinking everything was great, everything was fine, and lots of energy and being able to do everything that I thought I but not realizing that I was going to be manic and things like that. And so uh, it, 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 it gets intense and worse from there when you're in a full blown manic episode. And uh, your thoughts get distorted. And after the fact, you can look back and you can actually remember some of the thoughts that you're thinking. And you can say, What was I thinking? And so it's not a comfortable situation after the fact, but while you're in it, you feel so great, you know, creative thoughts, uh, tons of energy to act on the thoughts. And it, it's, it's a wonderful feeling, but it's very constructive after the fact, or during it, and then when you realize that after the fact, it's not, it's not fun to, to be there. It's embarrassing to realize what you were thinking, saying, and doing really not what's accurate or positive sometimes. And it's, it's uh, very emotional. Okay, so th that was um, just a part of like an hour and a half long documentary about bipolar disorder and it's at the end of this slide set as one of your um, recommended further readings or well viewings in this case. <laughs>
so you're going to crack. Okay. So all of those people were being interviewed about what mania is like when they were in presumably a euthymic state, maybe a depressive state. Um, but one feature of mania is that your mood is so different from baseline, so elevated, and that has an impact on the way that you perceive the world and the way that you function. So as a lot of them are saying, when they're in a manic episode, they don't have as much insight into how their behavior is abnormal or different than their, their usual behavior, or how some of the things that they're excited about or think are really good ideas at the time, looking back, don't make so much sense. Um, so this video is um, a YouTuber who shared a video that she took while she was in a manic episode. And obviously, like, we're not diagnosing her, we're taking her word for it that she was manic um when she filmed this video but it does demonstrate what someone who's in a manic episode might act like this isn't like the worst episode that i've had by any means uh, like worst episode i cut off my hair one of the worst episodes i actually overdosed in another bad episode so yeah this is definitely not the worst but um i think just like the way i'm talking and like how my hair has been very short and like things I'm saying aren't making any sense and I think like all oh, like overall like a good representation of mania. So yeah, I'm just gonna insert the clip right here so you guys can see for yourself and please stop talking about it. I don't know why I'm describing it, but you can just see it. realization and I was just like I need to just tell just tell myself okay so stop central by one direction it is the perfect depiction of mania like everything about that song like even from the beginning like it's I don't know what the is but I just and then they're like I know they'll be coming to find soon because eventually it's gonna get so it's gonna be like get better like stop this and like whatever right like it just or just I'll be like oh like, I thought this was just in the house the other day and so and it's just yeah but whatever so then that's when it gets to Stop it there. It goes on for a while. Um, in class, we can talk a little bit about specifically what signs of mania she's demonstrating in her behavior in this video. Um, but this is just basically a demonstration of what some it might be to interact with, it might be like to interact with someone who's having a manic episode or what mania looks like. Um, it can be most of the things that we've talked about so far are on a spectrum that most of us have kind of been in every part of. 
like anxiety and depression, everyone has felt the level of fear that people with anxiety disorders feel. Everyone has felt the level of sadness and um, low self-esteem that people with depressive disorders feel all the time. Um, mania is really a distinct departure from normal functioning, and it's not something that most people ever experience. So it can be a little hard to really picture what mania is like just from reading a clinical description. Okay, so we just talked about what mania is, but what differentiates the different um, bipolar spectrum disorders. Basically, it's the intensity and duration of mania and depressive episodes. So to meet criteria for bipolar disorder one, um, you have to have had at least one lifetime manic episode. You don't need to have a depressive episode in the past, but it's basically just assumed that you have, like we talked about before, people aren't that good at remembering past depression and depression is so common that even if someone doesn't ever have a manic episode, they have a decent chance of having depression at some point in their life, but that's unrelated. The key is that depression and mania, when mania is present, depression always occurs at some point. Um, there are maybe a few exceptions to that that we'll talk about in a few slides, but essentially, even though you only need to have a demonstrated manic episode to meet criteria for bipolar, it's just assumed that you've either been depressed before or you will be depressed in the future. Um, bipolar 2 is diagnosed when someone has at least one lifetime hypomanic episode and at least one lifetime depressive episode and no lifetime manic episodes. People with bipolar 1 sometimes experience mania and sometimes experience hypomania. Um, but to meet criteria for bipolar 2, you have to have only experienced hypomania. And the reason that a historic depressive episode is required to diagnose bipolar 2 is that mania in and of itself isn't actually disordered or impairing. Um, arguably, it's not a symptom of psychopathology. It's just a mood state that feels really good and doesn't have any negative consequences. Because for it to have negative consequences, that would by definition make it a manic episode, which is something else that we'll talk about in a few slides. Um, also, as bad as people are at remembering depressive episodes, they may also be pretty bad at remembering hypomanic episodes or at distinguishing hypomania from normal happiness and excitement. So to diagnose someone with bipolar 2, you have to be pretty sure that they have had depression at some point in their life um, and that they've had hypomania at some point in their life. Because if it's just hypomania alone, it's arguably not a disorder. So cyclothymic disorder, um, in that song about diagnosis that we watched several lectures ago, she actually refers to bipolar light. Um, and that is a real Thing that people call cyclothymic disorder, apparently. I learned that from Stephen Fry, actually, in the video that we watched in the first depression lecture. Um, I've never heard anyone call it bipolar light, but that is kind of what it is, because to meet criteria for cyclothymic disorder, you have to have symptoms of mania and symptoms of depression, but never meet full criteria for a full-blown manic episode or a full-blown depressive episode. The thing about it, though, is that it's very chronic. So just like persistent depressive disorder requires that you have two years of consistently depressed mood, even though it's more mild than a major depressive episode, cyclothymia is the same. You have to have both manic and depressive, sorry, not manic, hypomanic and depressive symptoms for at least two years. And cyclothymia, is, it's not the same as mood swings. This is not like someone wildly vacillating between mania, sorry, hypomania and depression within a couple hours of each other or within the same day, the episodes have to be discrete from each other. So to meet criteria for a traditional depressive episode, you have to have symptoms for two weeks. To meet criteria for a manic episode, you have to have symptoms for one week. Um, the periods in cyclothymic disorder don't have to be that long because they're not full-blown manic or depressive episodes, but they do have to be clearly distinct from each other. And sometimes they're interspersed with periods of euthymia. Um, just like persistent depressive disorder, the symptoms of um, hypomania and depression have to be present more than half the time, or sorry, at least half the time. Um, and you can't go for more than two months symptom free to meet criteria for cyclothymic disorder. So cyclothymic disorder, it is a standalone disorder, but at the same time, a lot of people do convert to having a diagnosis of bipolar one or two. And that would happen when they experience um, a, a depressive episode to meet criteria for bipolar two or a full manic episode to meet criteria for bipolar one. 
Uh, so that might be a little confusing, um, but remember that the distinction between bipolar one and bipolar two is that in bipolar two, you've never had a full-blown manic episode, but you have to have had a demonstrated depressive episode plus hypomanic symptoms. Whereas in bipolar one, you never have to have a full-blown depressive episode, but you have to have at least one discrete manic episode. So when someone has cyclothymic disorder or cyclothymic symptoms um, for say a year, and then they go on to have a full depressive episode where before they were just meeting like two or three depress depression criteria, but now all of a sudden they're meeting six and for at least two weeks, that means they meet criteria for depression. And that means that they now meet criteria for bipolar two because they have a history of hypomania and history of depression. Um, and then to meet criteria for bipolar one disorder, they never have to have a depressive episode. They can just keep having those chronic mild depressive symptoms, but they have to have a full blown manic episode. So the lifetime prevalence of cyclothymic disorder is higher than that of bipolar one or two. We'll talk about their prevalence in another slide, but it's somewhere between two and 2.4% of the population have cyclothymic disorder. So a couple slides ago, I said that hypomania in and of itself isn't necessarily a disorder. Um, you can have, you can meet criteria for a hypomanic episode and not at all feel like you are sick. It doesn't feel it feels like a departure from normal functioning, but not in a bad way. Um, however, traditionally, that's how we picture hypomania, just like really elevated mood, feeling really productive, feeling really good about ourselves, feeling really social and interested in things, having a lot of energy to pursue projects, being too excited to sleep. Um, that feeling of not needing to sleep, probably the best way to picture what that feels like and how it's different from insomnia is thinking back to when you were a kid and it was like the day before your birthday or the day before your family went on a vacation and you were just really, really excited and you were too like keyed up and energetic to sleep the night before. So that's what hypomania feels like. It feels like feeling really excited and especially feeling really excited about projects or ideas that you have, but it can also have a dark side. Um, so one of the symptoms of hypomania is impulsivity and excessive risk taking. And if the risk taking crosses the line into being like physically dangerous or causing harm to you or someone else, that would probably put you into the realm of a manic episode, not just a hypomanic episode. But even when impulsive behavior doesn't have like clearly pathological consequences, it can still have negative consequences on your life, like spending too much money going out with your friends, like deviating from your budget when you wouldn't have if you were euthymic, um, starting conflict, so verbal or physical fights, um, having unsafe sex when you normally wouldn't, um, using substances when you normally wouldn't, getting into accidents because you're being reckless, um, or even just like making commitments that you don't want to keep because when people are hypomanic, they again can be impulsive. They're like really um, socially, they're feeling really socially outgoing and they might just sort of say whatever pops into their head. So you might tell someone that you love them or that they're your best friend or that you want to go out with them when you're hypomanic and then later when you're euthymic, realize that you don't actually feel that way. So those are some of the downsides of hypomania. Also, even though mania and hypomania are mostly characterized by an expansive, elevated, happy mood, people who are having a manic or hypomanic episode can also have irritable mood. And in fact, you can meet criteria for a manic or hypomanic episode with just irritable mood. You just need to have four instead of three symptoms because it Basically, it's just a little harder to distinguish irritable from normal functioning. Um, people with hypomania can experience anxious agitation. That's actually a diagnostic specifier that you give someone when they have both hypomania symptoms and also a lot of anxiety and psychomotor agitation. And sometimes people with hypomania just report that they feel uncomfortable because they recognize that their mood state is not normal and that it's um, I don't want to say artificially elevated, but it's elevated beyond what their normal baseline is and not for any real reason. So that, that feels uncomfortable. So sometimes people with hypomania just say that they don't like it because they feel too good and they know it's not real and they just want to be back to normal. So I also said um, a couple of slides ago that basically everyone with bipolar one disorder has depression. But there actually is some evidence that there is such a thing as unipolar mania. So again, unipolar just means only one side of the manic to depressive spectrum. And almost invariably, when people only stay on one side of that spectrum, it's the depressive side, because depression is super common. 
and depression is an extension of sadness and it's a response to stress and loss and it's just a much more common emotional experience than mania. However, there is a small amount of evidence that there are some individuals who experience mania and never, at least in a 20 year follow up period, never experience depression. Um, but it's rare. So only about two to 3% of people who have one manic episode never go on to have a depressive episode in the longest follow up period we have, which is 20 years. Um, so two to 3% of people with bipolar disorder with mania, so bipolar one disorder equals less than 0.01% of the population, it's 0.003% because it's 3% of 1%. So it's super rare, if not um, non-existent. Unipolar hypomania, we just don't know because on its own hypomania is not a disorder. And when people are feeling that way and never really experience any consequences from it, why would they seek treatment? So unipolar hypomania could very well exist. And in a few slides, we'll talk about the hypomanic temperament, which is sort of chronic low-key hypomania. But as a disorder, it has not really been studied. So the perception is that the real downside to hypomania, aside from impulsivity, risk-taking, doing things that are out of character, and um, sometimes being anxious or agitated or irritable, the real, real downside is that most people who report hypomania to a psychologist are actually there because they're depressed. So there's a perception that the downside of hypomania is that it always leads to depression. That may or may not be true, and it probably isn't. Okay, so I mentioned specifiers for bipolar one and two. Um, specifiers are when you give someone a DSM diagnosis, specifiers just allow you to give a little bit more information about what their symptoms look like. It doesn't change the diagnosis, it just describes it a little bit more. So one specifier that actually makes a really big difference in someone's prognosis is rapid cycling. And this is when someone moves between manic and depressive episodes with only brief periods of euthymia in between. Um, it, shoot, you know, I'm blanking on the actual diagnostic criteria. It involves having either four or six mood episodes in a one year period, which is a lot. And the longer someone goes with untreated rap rapid cycling bipolar disorder, the shorter the euthymic periods in between the mood episodes become until eventually someone can cycle so rapidly that they almost never get a break from being in a mood episode. So rapid cycling bipolar disorder has a, a worse prognosis. It's more resistant to treatment and it tends to worsen over time more than other types of bipolar disorder. Mixed features is also a negative prognostic indicator, mostly because so what mixed features is, is someone meets full criteria for a manic episode. So they have elevated mood and grandiosity or sorry, elevated mood um, or irritable mood with three or four of the additional mania symptoms. So grandiosity, less need for sleep, less appetite, um, goal-oriented behavior, um, impulsivity and risk-taking. So they have all the features of a manic episode, but they also have a couple features of a depressive episode. Not necessarily enough that they would meet full criteria for depression. They don't necessarily have five out of nine symptoms, but they have some depression symptoms. They have both lots and lots of energy but also they feel really bad about themselves. They also might be suicidal. So someone who's in that mood state is actually in a lot of danger of committing suicide because um, when you're manic, you're really goal oriented, you're really good at getting things done and you're impulsive. And those are all potential risk factors for completing suicide when you have suicidal ideation. So mixed features tend to indicate a more severe illness and also definitely indicate higher risk of death. Um, mixed features specifier can also apply to a unipolar depressive disorder. So you can meet all criteria for a depressive disorder and have some manic symptoms, which is equally dangerous. Um, atypical versus melancholic applies to the depressive episodes in bipolar. And it's the same distinction as we talked about in the first mood disorder lecture. Um, anxious distress, I described a little bit a couple slides ago, but essentially it's, it's a specifier for um, the mood episode in bipolar disorder. And it's when someone is really depressed and has five out of nine or more symptoms of depression, but also has a lot of anxiety. Um, 
catatonia we're going to talk a lot more about in the psychosis lecture because catatonia is basically a symptom of psychosis so it can be present in depression or mania but only when there are psychotic features pretty much so the last specifier is mood congruent or mood incongruent psychotic features and what congruent means is just like consistent or like in line with and incongruent means inconsistent so we're going to talk a little bit about that distinction and I'm going to give some examples with first person perspectives of what the difference is. Okay, so this is Kay Jamison. We talked about her in the first depression lecture when we talked about grief. Um, but as I said at the time, she is a Johns Hopkins professor who's a, like a world expert on mood disorders and especially bipolar disorder. And she has bipolar disorder herself and speaks about it a lot. I've really been psychotic when manic, uh, which is not uncommon with mania. And um, it's been mostly when I've been manic, it's been a very exhilarating sort of thing, including the hallucinations. Um, I went around the solar system. I went to Saturn uh, in my mind's eye. I went through the star fields. It was, it was a glorious sort of ecstatic experience, which is frequently the case with me. And we, when you think about a lot of the great religious ecstasies, there's a very manic quality to that, a very grandiose, and it tend to be very universal, cosmic, related to everything's related to everything. So there's just um, a sort of food congruent. Um, you know, uh, hallucinating myself in Daniel as um, just covered with blood. I mean, it, mania is can be as terrifying as it gets. It is certainly as insane as one gets. And so it's it's frightening when it gets out of control, but there are periods of mania where they can be extremely attractive, unfortunately, probably sometimes. Okay, so the, she first described mood congruent psychosis in mania, where she was describing like going on going into outer space in her mind, hallucinating about um, everything being interconnected, having really grand um, delusions about like the universe and her place in it. All of that is mood congruent because when you're manic, your mood is really elevated and happy and these hallucinations were really exciting and ecstatic. She also described mood incongruent manic hallucinations where she was in a manic episode but was like hallucinating that she was dead or that she was covered in blood. Those are not congruent with feeling happy and elevated, but that kind, that sort of um, hallucination or delusional content would be more congruent with depressed mood. Um, okay, so this is a video of a patient talking about her mood congruent psychotic symptoms when she was in a depressive episode. But this patient has bipolar disorder and it's actually much more common for patients to have psychotic depression when they have bipolar disorder. Um, as we'll talk about later in this lecture, depressive symptoms in mania tend to be, or in, sorry, in bipolar disorder tend to be more severe than the average depressive symptoms in unipolar disorder. Um, and psychotic depression is on the really severe end. Hi everyone, this is Sally, and today I'm going to speak about psychotic depression. In my last video, I spoke about psychotic mania, and I've been psychotic for manic a couple of times, but I've also been psychotically depressed. And as I said in my last video, not everybody who has bipolar disorder will experience psychosis. However, some of us will. I've been psychotically depressed once, and it was the worst experience of my life. I had had a psychotic panic episode prior. And immediately after that episode, I became depressed, and depression lasted for a better part of a year. And in the depths of that depression, I I experienced visual hallucinations and they were called transept. And I was also paranoid. I thought people wanted to do experiments on me and I believed people would take my thoughts. Okay, so she just described hallucinations and delusions, psychotic symptoms that were mood congruent and some that were mood incongruent. So the mood congruent symptoms were the ones that had to do with death because preoccupation with death and dying is a symptom of depression. And it's something that people without depression are more likely to think about when they're in a sad mood state. Um, hallucin or delusions related to persecution and feeling paranoid 
those do feel bad. Like they're not fun hallucinations to have, but they're also like some of the most common types of hallucination. So they're not necessarily mood congruent or incongruent. Um, really clearly mood incongruent, or sorry, really clearly mood congruent delusions would be delusions that everyone hates you, delusions that you are guilty of some terrible like sin or crime, delusions that you're dirty or disgusting, delusions that your body is decaying. So again, content that has to do with death or really low self-worth, self-loathing. Okay, so I already mentioned the prevalence of cyclothymic disorder. It's around two to 2.5%. The lifetime prevalence of bipolar one disorder is around 1% and the lifetime prevalence of bipolar two is around one to 2%. So I just wanna highlight here that for the first time, so far in this class, we're speaking about disorders that are really, really deviant in the sense that they're really abnormal and really rare. Um, one of the four Ds that we talked about really early in class is that a behavior is deviant. And that one maybe doesn't apply as well to anxiety and depression, even when they're at a pathological, dysfunctional, distressing extreme. Because anxiety disorders as a whole have a population lifetime prevalence of somewhere between 30 and 40%. And depression is even higher. Um, estimates that we have range from 30 to 50%, but they could still be underestimates. By contrast, um, bipolar spectrum disorders really are rare. Only somewhere between four and 5.5% of the population will experience them. And the majority will experience the, lo like the lower, less severe range um, having cyclothymic disorder. So we talked a little bit about recurrence of depression and how most, or not most, but about half of people who have one depressive episode never go on to have another one. That's not the case with people who have manic episodes. People who have a bipolar spectrum diagnosis, 90% um, have more than one mood episode in their lifetime. However, those estimates are based on treatment seeking samples. They're not, those estimates aren't based on surveying the general population. Population-wide studies are a little bit harder to do with a disorder that's as rare as mania, because even if you survey, say, a thousand people, you're only going to talk to 40 who have um, bipolar spectrum symptoms. And those 40 people just aren't likely to be representative. Whereas if you did a population-based survey of a thousand people, you might talk to 400 people who have depression or 400 people who have anxiety. So it's a little bit harder to know what mania and bipolar spectrum symptoms look like in the general population. But we do know that not everyone who has these symptoms ever seeks treatment either because they don't want to, they don't think that they have a problem, or because they don't have access to enough healthcare to seek treatment. Um, but what we do know again from clinical treatment seeking samples, so when we make the distinction between population based and treatment seeking samples, what we're implying is that treatment seeking samples are probably more severe. Um, that's probably the main difference. Like I did mention economic factors that could keep people from accessing treatment, but especially with something like bipolar disorder, one of the defining features of mania is that it often involves hospitalization. So on the other hand of the argument I just made, um, bipolar people with bipolar disorder, especially, might not really exist in the general population without being recognized because by definition their symptoms have to be really severe, severe enough to warrant psychiatric hospitalization. So anyway, let's just say that the majority of people, more almost 100%, 90%, who have a manic episode will have a future manic or depressive episode. Um, and that same population has a very, very high mortality rate, um, largely with suicide. So between 25 and 50% of people with these diagnoses attempt suicide. Um, that doesn't mean that that many people die from suicide because the majority of suicide attempts don't end in death. Um, but people with bipolar spectrum disorders also have a really high rate of accidental death because again, they engage in reckless impulsive behavior. So some prognostic features for depression, or sorry, for bipolar disorders. Um, Disorders that have a poor response to treatment or a more severe lifetime course, so more severe and impairing symptoms over the course of someone's life, involve rapid cycling, um, anxious agitation, so a lot of anxiety in addition to their depression symptoms or in addition to their manic symptoms. 
um, delayed treatment. So the longer that bipolar disorders are left untreated, the worse treatment response in the future will be, and the worse the person's prognosis will be, the more likely that they'll have a recurrence. And then the severity of symptoms, and particularly it's the severity of depression that seems to predict poor response to treatment in, in bipolar disorder and not necessarily the severity of mania. And that's probably because mania is by definition very severe. Um, as Professor Jameson said, it's the most basically the most severe mental illness can get just by definition. So really it's the severity of the depression that predicts because there's a wider range of severity in depression. Things that are associated with a better prognosis in bipolar spectrum disorders are pre-morbid functioning. So if you have more education, if you're in a more stable social relationship, so married, um, and faster treatment. So as we'll talk a lot about with psychosis, there's reason to believe that severe mental illness is neurodegenerative. It's bad for your brain to have untreated mania or untreated severe depression or untreated psychosis. So the sooner people access treatment, the better off they are. And education and being married are probably protective factors because they help people access treatment sooner. Um, if, you're, if you're in a relationship and living with someone, they're gonna notice if you're manic and encourage you to get treatment. Um, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. But, oh, sorry, I was gonna say, these are some of the same protective factors that um, predict a better prognosis in schizophrenia too. They are sort of just, the idea is that the more access to treatment you have, the more coping resources, the more cognitive resources you have before the disorder hits you and the shorter duration of symptoms, the better off you'll be. Which is why education about psychology is so important. Um, it's like we talked about early in the semester, it's about health literacy. So it's important to know that if you have these symptoms, the sooner you seek treatment, the better your prognosis will be and the less damage it will do to your brain. Okay, so I wanted to highlight these findings because this is actually from a population-based study and some of this data sort of seem to go against a lot of what I just said, that 90% of people who have a manic episode will go on to have another one or will go on to have a depressive episode. It also helps to illustrate a point that I'm going to be returning to throughout this lecture, that even though depression is a feature of bipolar disorder, even though they clearly share symptoms and risk. Depression itself is not a risk factor for bipolar spectrum disorders. So that is illustrated in this population-based study. This was a prospective study of adolescents and young adults who were first assessed for having a mood disorder diagnosis when they were either somewhere between the ages of 14 and 24, and then followed up with four years later when they were ages 18 to 28. So the Colors of the bars represent the type of mood episode they were diagnosed with at baseline. So when they were first evaluated at 14 to 24. So the dark blue is um, neither a hypomanic slash manic or a depressive episode. As you can see, the majority of them, 88%, um, in the next four years didn't go on to have either. And by far the most common diagnosis for people who didn't have a baseline manic episode to have over the next four years was depression. Because again, as we've talked about, depression is really common. So about 9% of people had a depressive episode in that four year period when they had no prior history of mood symptoms. Um, the lighter purple bars are people who had had a hypomanic episode at the first baseline assessment, but hadn't had a depressive episode or a manic episode. So the most common thing for them to experience was was actually neither. So a little over 50% of people who had had at least one hypomanic episode over the next four years didn't go on to have another mood episode. The next most common thing for them was to have a depressive episode. So their chances of having a depressive episode were higher than the chances of people who had never had any mood episodes. So hypomania is clearly a risk factor for depression. Um, almost 30% of people who had hypomania went on to have a depressive episode. Um, and then a small percentage of them, but much higher than the population rate of these disorders went on to have a manic episode. So that's about 7%. And actually the numbers are pretty similar for people who had a manic episode. Um, 
a good number of them also didn't go on to have another mood episode. The majority who did go on to have another mood episode had a depressive episode, and more of them had a hypomanic episode than another manic episode. So the other thing to notice is that people who had a depressive episode at baseline, they were more likely to have another depressive episode than people who had no mood episode at baseline. So about like 22% of them went on to have a depressive episode. Um, their likelihood of having a depressive episode, even though the numbers are lower, it actually isn't significantly different than the likelihood for people who had a manic or hypomanic episode. But the important thing is that people who had a baseline depressive episode didn't have any higher risk of mania or hypomania than people who had neither. So what this is showing is that although having a manic or hypomanic episode is a very big risk factor for going on to have a depressive episode, the opposite of that isn't true. So having a depressive episode does not put you at elevated risk for having a manic or hypomanic episode. And even though obviously far from 90% of people who have a baseline hypomanic or manic episode go on to have another one during this study period, it's it is only four years and they are young, so they have lots of time ahead of them to have another mood episode and the majority probably will. That being said, though, it is a population based study, so it is possible that it's representing a population that's less severe or less likely to seek treatment than the clinical examples that we have. Okay, yeah, so the probability of a future manic or hypomanic episode was the same for people with a depressive episode and those without any mood episode. Okay, so even though bipolar one and two are defined by mania and hypomania respectively, um, people with those diagnoses actually spend much more time depressed than they do manic for the most part. So people with recurrent chronic bipolar disorders spend about 60% of their lives in a depressive episode and about 15% in a manic episode. Um, and that translates to about three times as many just days of their life feeling manic as first feeling depressed as feeling manic. So the other thing that, that indicates is that the manic part of bipolar one and two is actually less stable and less chronic than the depressive part and also that it's more treatable. It's more responsive to the medications that we prescribe for bipolar disorder um, and also more responsive to some of the lifestyle changes that people with bipolar disorder need to make to promote recovery. It actually is easier to prevent future manic episodes than it is to prevent future depressive episodes for people with bipolar disorder and also for people with recurrent depression. Okay, so that was kind of an overview of what bipolar disorder one and two and cyclothymia are, but just to really clarify and make sure that I'm dispelling some common misconceptions. So people will often use bipolar disorder as like a colloquial, colloquial way of saying like moody or having a lot of mood swings, but that is not what actual bipolar disorder is. Um, to meet criteria for bipolar disorder, you have to have discrete mood episodes where you have one week of mania and at least two weeks of depression and they don't co-occur, they have to be separate from each other or your diagnosis would be something more like um, the, either a manic or depressive episode with mixed features. Um, but even with mixed features, symptoms of both are present simultaneously. So it's not like someone is switching from euthymic to dysphoric mood, like rapidly or within the same day. They're just kind of feeling both ways at once. So people with bipolar disorder aren't having wild mood swings. They're just having wild changes in mood that last a really long time. People with bipolar disorder also don't have dual personalities or multiple sides to their personality. They're not like Mr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde. Um, They're not like people with multiple personality disorders. Um, both depression and mania are a clear departure from normal functioning, from normal mood. Um, and by actually by definition, mania is so different from how the person normally is that um, people in their lives notice and comment on it. It's a marked departure from who they are. However, though, there is a temperament, so a, a personality characteristic that is really strongly linked to risk for bipolar disorder. So even though their mood state and their cognitive functioning and their circadian rhythms are really different than how they usually are, at their core, their personality is actually the same because there are personality risk factors for mania that we will talk about next. And then I already talked about this in the context of hypomania, but even though 
a manic episode is defined by feeling really elevated, feeling really great some of the time. Mania doesn't always feel great. Um, it can, in a mixed episode, it can co-occur with dysphoric, depressed mood. In a manic episode with anxious agitation, it can co-occur with anxious mood. And when it's severe, it can cause psychotic symptoms that are often really terrifying. Um, even if they're mood congruent, they're very scary to experience. So another common misconception, probably based on the idea that bipolar disorder is characterized by mood swings, is that people with borderline personality disorder sometimes get misdiagnosed as having bipolar disorder. And borderline personality disorder, as we'll talk about in the personality disorders lecture, is actually characterized by rapid mood swings within a more discrete period of time. So like within a day or from moment to moment. So it's really important to remember that bipolar disorder does not involve mood swings. Um, if a person is having really severe mood swings that are impacting their functioning and getting in their way, it's more likely a different diagnosis. Okay, so we're gonna watch another um, first person perspective on mania. And this is um, from someone who's an artist and a writer talking about how mania interacts with his creative process. Something that wasn't right. Things started to look more beautiful, almost euphoric. Something wasn't right. Bipolar one disorder. I thought everyone was in on it. I just want to rot. It's almost euphoric. I thought everyone was in on it. I see signs, signs. So I'd be in the library looking for clues, looking for symbols, getting to a desk, scratching things down. So I found my way to um, the community church, sort of climbed the church, took my clothes off. And all I wanted to do was calm my brain. And then the next thing I knew, I was strapped down in a gurney in an ambulance. So my mind is flying. Bipolar one disorder, maybe you know, hard times. after the mania comes a depression. I don't think you can explain it to someone who doesn't have a mental illness or who hadn't experienced it. You're as low as you can go. It's a very dark place. It's suffocating because there's no break from it, not even for like five minutes. I think the deeper you fall into the depression, the more hopeless you get. So it's a dangerous thing because suicide enters your mind. I had my first manic episode when I was 16. I had a second in 2001. I had a third in 2003, a fourth in 2004. It culminated in going to a rehab facility and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I made a vow to take my meds, which I never broke. I got my life back together. Met a girl, got married, had a kid, and it was great. It was nine years of peace. When I'm healthy, meaning not in a mania or depression, I'm completely functional. You sort of put your uh, bipolar coat into the closet. It's not affecting you in any way. That's why it was so surprising that something happened after that. I don't think you ever start to feel the mania come on. It's just sort of starts. You trick your mind into thinking you're okay. What's happening feels right. You're doing creative things. You don't want that to end. I kept climbing. You reach a point of psychosis. You've totally lost grip of reality and it's scary. The interesting thing about this last manic episode was that I had stayed on my medication. So I didn't think in my head that if I took my medication, it could ever happen again. What I learned was that I'm not in control of it. I have to surrender that it might happen. So how I channel this creative energy that uh, bipolar provides, I channel it into my writing. I have probably 50 notebooks. Some are from when I was manic and I'm just scribbling things down and in arrows and symbols and whatnot. Others are more concise when I'm stable and I'm planning out the books. I've written two books. I'm working on the third one now. And the main character has bipolar. My books are fuller, they're richer, there's more to them because of experiences I've had in the past. I feel like I can help people struggling with it right now. You just make a vow and you will never 
commit suicide. Because if you don't, I can promise you, you'll rise up again. If I could go back in time and not have bipolar disorder, I wouldn't take it. And it's worth all those downs and all those ups to be able to help someone else get through it. Okay, so just a few um, takeaways from that video, things that it sort of illustrates about what bipolar disorder is like, um, is that for the person experiencing it, they often will perceive, especially with mania, that it comes on all of a sudden. But when we talk about treatment later in this lecture, it's actually really important that someone um, recovers from bipolar disorder and also depression, that they learn to recognize some of the early warning signs and some of the environmental triggers. Um, because it is possible to turn around an oncoming depressive or manic episode. As he talks about, even though he's a really high functioning person with a family life and a career, his mental illness is severe enough that he experiences frequent suicidality and has needed hospitalization in the past. And the severity, when someone has bipolar disorder, that level of severity is usually present in both their manic and their depressive episodes. So again, depression is more severe in bipolar disorder. Um, he described a really chronic course with recurrent episodes of mania or depression, but also periods of euthymia in between. He also described a, a degree of treatment resistance. He was stable and euthymic for nine years. Um, and then without him necessarily changing anything he was doing, the disorder came back. So bipolar disorder has a chronic course and medications can sort of suppress and manage it and also prevent it from doing any damage. But that's really all they're doing. They're not necessarily making it go away or curing it. The last thing to take away from this video is that for him, in his experience, there's a clear link between mania and creativity, both that it gives him ideas and it informs his writing, but also he's able to channel some of the energy and focus and drive that comes with mania into writing and into being creative. So we just talked about myths associated with bipolar disorder. Um, one sort of common knowledge thing about bipolar disorder that actually isn't a myth is that creative people, um, people who are successful in creative professions, are actually more likely to have bipolar spectrum disorders, especially bipolar one. So Kay Jamison has done some research on this and she and others have documented a surprisingly high prevalence of bipolar disorder in successful creative people. The textbook mentions a couple studies that show that about 20% of the most widely respected poets of the 20th century had bipolar one disorder. So um, this is Sylvia Plath, um, Robert Lowell, and Anne Sexton. Um, as you probably may or may not know, Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton both ended up committing suicide, which is also very common in people with bipolar disorder. Um, but conservatively, 20% of most widely respected and well-published 20th century poets had bipolar one disorder, and that's compared to 1% of the general population. Um, in population-based studies, so this time not just looking at people who are famously creative, but looking at just the general population, people with bipolar one disorder are more likely to be in a creative field, like they're more likely to be writers or artists or art teachers or work as set designers or caterers or cooks, anything creative people with bipolar spectrum disorders are more likely to do it. Um, and then even today, looking at famous people that we, we all probably know, bipolar disorders are still more common in successful actors. Um, so these are just actors who have been public about having bipolar disorder. This is not speculation. Um, but Carrie Fisher, um, Robert, shoot, I'm going to forget his name. You know, the guy that Katy Perry used to date. Okay, I'm not going to remember his name, and Robin Williams. Um, but they've all spoken publicly about their bipolar disorder. It is a misconception that um, Robin Williams' suicide was caused by the bipolar disorder. I mean, obviously, we can't ever say what caused a suicide, but we will talk later in this lecture about how problematic the coverage of his suicide was. And part of that was that it was linked to his bipolar disorder and kind of romanticized, because bipolar disorder is kind of romanticized given its link to creativity and talent. Russell Brand? Yeah. Man, 
Okay, um, also, so those were famous actors, some famous musicians, and this is just like a tiny sample. It would be easy to have three different pictures here. But Demi Lovato has spoken publicly about her bipolar disorder. Jimi Hendrix wrote a song about his bipolar disorder. Mariah Carey has spoken about her bipolar disorder. Um, so it's not a myth that bipolar disorder is linked to creativity. And that's like a really fascinating thing about it that when we dig down a little bit deeper might actually help us to understand where bipolar disorder comes from and thinking from an evolutionary perspective, why a disease that is so severe and impairing could have been preserved in our population. So this is another study. Um, this was done with it's what's known as a chart review study where researchers basically just go back and read all of the medical records of people with a specific diagnosis that they're interested in. So this was a chart review study of a thousand patients who were diagnosed with a depressive episode. Um, and the goal of the study was to distinguish between the ones who had unipolar depression and the ones who had bipolar one or two. But the important thing to remember is that all of them initially presented with depression. So the group that had bipolar two or bipolar one, I guess mostly it was bipolar two, just again, because it's more common and these were outpatients. So bipolar one is gonna be more common in inpatient settings, bipolar two in outpatient settings. Um, but people who had bipolar two, but who were in a mood episode at the time, they were more likely to speak multiple language languages. They were more likely to have um, recognized achievements in creative fields or if they weren't in a creative field, they were more likely to have some kind of professional success in their own field. Personality-wise, they were more likely to be sexually adventurous. They were described as flamboyant. They described themselves as activity junkies or adrenaline junkies. So this, oh, and the red sign is a term that these authors coined that statistically people with bipolar 2 disorder, when they're depressed, were more likely to be wearing red shirts, dresses, or pants. Um, so obviously, like none of these traits or behaviors or historical things are diagnostic of bipolar 2. They're just associated with it. But then on the negative side, people with bipolar 2 and depression had a more severe illness than people with just depression. They were more likely to have multiple comorbidities. They were more likely to have problematic substance and alcohol use. They were more likely to have impulse control disorders, so things like gambling and binge eating. Um, and even though they were, on the one hand, described as professionally successful and really creatively accomplished, they also reported a lot of professional instability and personal instability. So they were more likely to have been divorced. They were more likely to have a lot of failed friendships and romantic relationships. They were more likely to have been fired from jobs in the past. So this is starting to paint a picture of not just what the symptoms of bipolar disorder look like when someone is in a manic episode, but what the temperament of people with bipolar disorder is like. Because all of these things have nothing to do with the person's disorder. These are things that they accomplished when they were healthy, when they were depressed, when they were manic. Um, being hypomanic didn't do any of this. This is just who they are. So again, these traits were found to be statistically more common in people with bipolar 2, but that does not mean that if you have these traits, you have bipolar 2. It doesn't mean that depressed people didn't have these traits. It just means that they were more common in people with bipolar 2. So going back to this link between um, artistic eminence and success and bipolar spectrum disorders, Research looking at sort of the trajectory of people's mood episodes and their artistic productivity has shown that it's actually mania that is more linked to creative output than depression. There's no relationship between depression and creativity, either in people with bipolar disorders or people with unipolar depression. Um, that is a myth. There's this sort of myth of like the tortured, depressed artist, and that part just does not seem to be true. What is true, though, is that artists who experience mania are more creative and more productive after a manic episode. And probably that's because a lot of the creativity is happening on the upswing of a manic episode. So manic episodes come on slowly and the symptoms often will ramp up and get worse the longer the episode goes on. One of the people in the first video we watched mentioned that there's a relationship between the lack of sleep that happens during a manic episode and the increasing severity of symptoms. So manic episodes tend to get more severe and more intense over time. But in the early days of a manic episode, 
people might be really only feeling the benefits before they start to experience the negative parts. So they're having lots of ideas, they're feeling really confident, they're experiencing an increase in goal-directed behavior, they're more willing to take risks. All of that does translate to increased artistic productivity and maybe to creativity in that they're having a lot of ideas. However, something else that one of the, the patients in that video mentioned was that even though she has a lot of ideas when she's manic, she's not great at actually acting on them and making them a reality. Um, so the important thing to remember there is that it's not the mania that makes people creative. Um, the mania might help them to be more productive. It might help them to have faster or more diverse artistic output. But when someone is in a severe manic episode or when someone's in a severe depressive episode, they are unable to work. They're not having their best ideas. And even if they are, they're not able to put them into action. Um, this has also been confirmed in research with artists who report being totally debilitated and unable to work when they're at their worst in a manic episode. And this quote from Vincent van Gogh, who's thought to have had psychotic bipolar disorder or possibly schizophrenia, but in any case, lots of depression. Um, he wrote that he was so angry with himself because he couldn't do what he wanted to do, which in context was art. So there's this perception, another myth about bipolar disorder that bipolar disorder itself, that mania itself is the source of creativity and artistic achievement and that medicating it and treating it takes away creativity. And that part is definitely not true. In fact, there have been studies that show that bipolar patients, when they are stable, when they're euthymic, are still more creative than controls and then unipolar depression patients. So again, it's not the mania that makes someone creative. The mania might make them more productive, but it does not make them more creative. So what does make them more creative? Um, there is this theory of what's called the hypomanic temperament, which is basically like the right amount of mania, an amount of mania that is never impairing, that enhances productivity and creativity, and that also enhances things like popularity, charisma, um, career success, not just in creative fields, because people with this temperament are really energetic, really productive, they might consistently need a little bit less sleep. So Bill Clinton is here because he is, and again, I am not diagnosing him, although this psychologist who wrote a biography, a biography of him did kind of diagnose him with having hypomanic temperament. But whether or not he has this temperament, his personality and behaviors sort of exemplify it. So he was known for being so charismatic, extremely energetic. He would like work day and night on his campaigns. Um, when he was president, he slept like four hours a night and said that that was all he needed. He was obviously very self-assured and confident. You have to be to run for president. He was known to be really entertaining. He could talk just extemporaneously for hours at a time. Um, and he was really sexually forward. Some people found him really sexually charismatic and exciting. Other people were pressured into having sex with him. That is a temperament that is shared by other presidents. Um, but Bill Clinton is a really great example of it. So even though the hypomanic temperament sounds great, it does come with a downside in that people with this temperament are at elevated risk for bipolar disorder. They're not at elevated risk for just depression. So it's really the hypomanic temperament leads to risk for hypomania and mania, not depression. This isn't exactly a downside, but it's also important to remember that even though people with this temperament can be really attractive and charming um, and tend to be successful, it doesn't predict success on its own you need to have something to work with for self-confidence and charisma to get you anywhere. You have to be intelligent or talented and you have to have some baseline opportunities. So people with this temperament also need privilege. They also need access. You need a way to get in the door. Um, this temperament is not enough to just like pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Not that anything is enough without privilege. Um, the same person who wrote this biography of, of Bill Clinton about him having a hypomanic temperament has also promoted this idea um, that America is a particularly hypomanic country, that because there was a lot of immigration to America throughout our history and continuing today, that was increasing the prevalence of the hypomanic temperament in the American gene pool because people who immigrate, um, according to this theory, are more likely to be risk takers, to be confident, to be 
energetic to have some of these hypomanic qualities. Um, I included it because I think it's sort of an interesting theory, um, but there's not a ton of great evidence for it that, and the best evidence for this would, well, the best evidence would be population-based study showing higher levels of hypomanic temperament in the United States compared to other countries, and specifically other countries that are matched to the immigration patterns to the United States. So like we would need like Mexico and Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa to really make this comparison. Of course, also not all immigration is the same. There was forced migration. There was um, refugee resettlement. Not all immigrants have this like move to America and pull yourself up by the bootstraps story. So anyway, it's there's mixed evidence for this, but probably it's not so much that we have a hypomanic temperament as a country. It's more that as a culture, we value that temperament. We are an individualistic country. We value people who seem to be self-made, who seem to um, have drive and ambition. So it's not necessarily so much that America has more of these traits. It's just that we elevate them more and value and respect them more. And we elect people with these traits president. Okay, so all of that kind of leads to this question of if bipolar disorder is so severe, and it is, why did it persist in the population? How did people with bipolar disorder survive long enough to reproduce if their mental illness was so severe and disabling? Part of the answer to that, as it is with a lot of disorders, is that the age of onset in bipolar disorder varies. So it's possible that some of our ancestors with bipolar disorder were able to reproduce um, before the onset of their mental illness. And still though, that would have affected their reproductive fitness because having a parent with severe mental illness, especially in hunter-gatherer society would be a disadvantage to the children. Um, so the other hypothesis for why bipolar disorder has persisted in the population is that mania at the lowest levels, so the hypom hypomanic temperament is adaptive, even though it doesn't necessarily get you anywhere if you don't have talent and um, connections and privilege, Confidence, charisma, and lots of energy are positive traits, and it's easy to see how they could confer a reproductive advantage. Um, at, more, at more moderate levels, so hypomania and in the early stages of mania, it's more of a balance, it's more of a two-sided coin where there are really good things, like being really productive, being really passionate, having a lot of ideas, being really willing to act on them and take risks artistically and personally. And those things can all be really positive and advantageous, but the negative side of that is that people with these moderate levels are more prone to depression and they're also more prone to mania which is the highest level expression of this trait and at that level it's there's nothing good about it it's debilitating it's dangerous there's a high risk of suicide and people who are artistic or passionate about their careers are sidelined from the things that they're passionate about when they're mad okay So another question to ask is, we've talked a little bit about how having a depressive episode doesn't confer risk for a manic episode and having a hypomanic temperament doesn't confer risk for depression. Although it does confer risk for bipolar disorder, which includes depression, but it does not confer risk for unipolar depression without mania. So part of the answer to that is that mania is more heritable than depression. Um, depression is actually one of the less heritable mental illnesses. And heritability basically just means, so a heritability of 32%, the most simple, like the simple explanation is that 32% of an individual person's risk for developing depression is their genetics. And the rest of their risk has to do with the environment that they grew up in and their life experiences. So the, what depression having a heritability of 32% shows is that the environment has a huge influence on whether someone will go on to develop depression. The environment has a much lower influence on whether someone will go on to develop a bipolar spectrum disorder. Um, if you have the high risk genes for bipolar spectrum disorder, there is a 62% chance that you'll develop it, regardless of what happens in your environment. So genes are responsible for 62% of the variability in someone's risk for getting bipolar disorder. <coughs> um, bipolar one disorder, so frank clear cut mania is even more heritable. So the heritability of that is 83%. And another way to think about this is that it's hard to 
know what any individual person's genetic risk is because we don't know the specific genes for these disorders. But we estimate heritability based on the likelihood that someone will have a disorder if their parent or sibling has that disorder. So then they share 50% of their genes. So if it's totally related to um, genetics, then still they would only have like a 50% chance, you would think. Whereas someone who is a identical twin or a monozygotic twin shares 100% of their genes with their twin. So if their twin has bipolar disorder, a monozygotic twin has an 83% chance of also having bipolar disorder. That means that the influence of the environment on bipolar disorder is still present, um, but it's much less. So in other words, mania and bipolar disorder are more heritable. Interestingly, though, there's definitely overlapping risk for mania and depression on the mania side. So depression itself is not a risk factor for mania, but mania is a risk factor for depression. And when your identical twin has bipolar disorder, you're also at elevated risk for depression. Um, so, but conversely, when your twin has unipolar disorder, you're not at elevated risk for mania. Another difference between the two, so heritability is one difference with depression being much less heritable, but with overlapping heritable risk. Um, the nature of depression in bipolar disorder is different than the nature of depression in unipolar disorder. It basically it's more severe. It also has an earlier onset. It tends to be more chronic and recurrent. Um, it has more severe symptoms like psychosis and it's more endogenous, which means it's less triggered by the environment. So unipolar depression or major depressive disorder is very triggered by the environment. The depression that people experience in bipolar disorder is more likely to feel like it comes out of nowhere. It's not as likely to be triggered by a major stressor or a major loss the way that unipolar depression is. So the takeaways from that is that unipolar depression is less heritable and that's because it's more easily triggered by the environment. Um, based on this pattern of data, we can kind of assume that bipolar disorder represents just a more severe variant of major depressive disorder in that there's shared genetic risk for depression between bipolar and unipolar depression, but people with bipolar disorder have additional genetic liability for mania. So what that might suggest is that when a person has more risk genes for a mood disorder, those risk genes mean that their depression is likely to be more severe and they also need to have a lot more risk in order to go on to develop mania. It requires additional genetic risk beyond the genetic risk that contributes to depression. But that genetic risk is shared between unipolar and bipolar depression. Okay, so another way that unipolar and bipolar depression are related is that both depression and mania involve alterations in the monoamine system. So we talked about the sort of starring role of, of serotonin in depression. And that's probably because serotonin helps to regulate the balance of norepinephrine and dopamine, which are the other two monoamines. Um, dopamine has a bigger role in bipolar disorder and in mania, which basically means that in people who are manic, they're experiencing the most disruption and dysregulation in dopamine signaling. And dopamine is the neurotransmitter that governs the behavioral activation system, so the parts of our brain that govern reward-seeking behavior and the experience of reward. When we're feeling the emotion of pleasure, what is happening in our brains is that we're producing a lot of dopamine and, the, um, and it's signaling in the prefrontal cortex. When we're taking a risk, like if we go bungee jumping or skydiving, or if we're going out of our way to earn a reward or achieve something, like if we're competing in an athletic event or um, gambling, um, doing any behavior that involves risks and rewards, that behavior is mediated by dopamine signaling. So another similarity, and that was a bit of a similarity and a difference in that dopamine is a monoamine and it is dysregulated in major depression, but it's more dysregulated in bipolar disorder. Um, and possibly in the other direction, because in major depressive disorder, there seems to be a bit of a deficit in reward seeking and goal oriented behavior. People are less likely to do it. Whereas again, in mania, people are more likely to do it. So it could be that low levels of dopamine are more implicated in depression and high levels in mania. And another indicator that that could be true is that a successful treatment for depression is known as behavioral activation, which basically works to elevate someone out of a depressed mood by encouraging them to engage in more goal-directed and rewarding activities. 
So depression can become sort of a vicious cycle where nothing is as rewarding to you. So you stop doing things that used to be rewarding um, because they're not as rewarding. That makes sense. But that leads to a cycle where you're not doing anything fun. You're not really going out of the house. You're not socializing as much. You're not investing as much in your job. So you're, put, you're making yourself more likely to experience failures and rejection, the stress generation hypothesis that we talked about last time. And you're also denying yourself opportunities to experience natural rewards. So the treatment for depression is kind of to fake it till you make it. So regardless of whether you feel like doing it, go out and do the things that you used to do before you were depressed, the things that used to bring you joy and the things that used to be rewarding and make you feel successful. And even if it doesn't feel as good as it used to, the theory is that it probably will feel better than just sitting on your couch. And the more often you do those things, the more your mood is elevated and the more rewarding they actually are. So it's a virtuous cycle where the more you do it, the more rewarding it becomes to do it. So engaging in goal-directed behavior and seeking out opportunities to experience reward helps to lift someone out of a depressive episode. So that just helps to illustrate how mania is kind of, if you were to continue along that pathway, you could end up in a manic episode. And actually people who have bipolar disorder, they do have to really manage um, their engagement in goal-directed activities and their level of stimulation and excitement because those things can trigger a manic episode in someone who has bipolar disorder. Okay, so the last way that I'm gonna talk about is that although we talked about how depression in mania is more endogenous, it's more um, internal and less responsive to the environment, both mania and depression can be triggered by the environment, um, but different environmental stressors. So depression is triggered by stress, by loss, by failure, by negative life events. And mania, on the other hand, in people with bipolar disorder is triggered by positive life events and overstimulation and engaging in lots of goal-directed activity. They can be kind of a warning sign when someone has bipolar, if they start doing a lot of projects or getting too, basically getting too excited about things. And it's not that people who are in recovery from bipolar disorder can't ever get excited, but they have to manage that as like a high risk time for the, possible, the possibility of a manic episode. Um, both depression, unipolar depression and bipolar disorder tend to become more endogenous over time. So in unipolar depression, a first depressive episode is more likely to be triggered by an environmental stressor, but then subsequent depressive episodes are increasingly likely to be endogenous, so not necessarily triggered by anything in the environment or triggered by the environment, but by a lower level stressor than it would have taken originally to trigger a depressive episode. And that is the kindling theory of mood disorders, that basically the more time you spend depressed or manic, the better your brain gets at being in that state and the easier it is to trigger that state. So the less input from the environment is needed. Related to the environment, um, sleep plays a role in both depression and mania. And specifically, sleep deprivation elevates mood. So when someone is depressed, if they skip a night of sleep, they will usually be fine the next day. It's not lasting though, because as soon as they go back to sleep, they'll go back to being depressed. But for someone who is bipolar, um, that sleep deprivation, so like going for a night without sleep can actually trigger a manic episode because it has that same mood elevating effect, but they're, instead of going from depressed to euthymic, they're going from euthymic to hypomanic or manic. Okay, so we're almost done talking about bipolar disorder. Um, and we're not gonna talk a ton about treatment because this class is more focused on the psychopathology, but just to give you a, sometimes what works for treatment can give you kind of an idea about what causes or maintains the disorder. So one thing that we, that gives us insight into what causes and maintains bipolar disorder is that antidepressant medications, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and especially selective norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitors are contraindicated because they can trigger mania. So the same thing that can sort of lift someone out of a depressive state into a euthymic state in someone who's manic can take them too far and cause a manic episode. So lithium is one of the first psychiatric medications to actually be effective. Um, in an earlier lecture, we talked about how the biological theory of psychopathology really suffered because none of the medical treatments that were available um, in the 18th century were really remotely effective. Um, so lithium is one of the first effective drugs for mental illness. And it's actually not a drug, it is um, an element. 
And as such, it actually, it's one of the cheaper psychiatric drugs because nobody owns it. Um, one of the best things about lithium is that it does treat acute mania, but it really seems to help prevent future onset of mania. And specifically, lithium seems to help prevent suicide. Even when lithium doesn't stabilize someone's mood, it still reduces their likelihood of committing suicide. Um, lithium, it doesn't work for everyone, and it also has what's known as a narrow therapeutic window, where the dose that you need for it to work is very close to the dose where it becomes lethal. Um, so it's easy to accidentally overdose on lithium. And even if you don't overdose, it can have negative effects on your liver function. So being on lithium requires like constant blood work and monitoring your liver levels. Um, so it's not for everyone. It's a hard drug to be on. So more recent advances in mood stabilizing drugs include what are known as anti-convulsant mood stabilizers. And these are drugs that were originally designed to treat epilepsy. So basically they work by sort of calming down overactive brain signaling. Epilepsy is just too many random signals that start to um, create like a vicious cycle where once your brain starts being overly activated, it just gets more and more activated and can't put a damper on the activation. In epilepsy, that activation is more general but in, in mania, it seems like there might be overactivation in the dopamine system. So anticonvulsant mood stabilizers could work by helping to just overall reduce overactivity in certain brain regions. Um, however, it actually seems to be the case that these drugs might be more helpful in the depressive episodes of bipolar disorder than the manic episodes. They might work better to stabilize um, depressed mood than manic mood. Um, on the flip side, antipsychotic medications are more effective against mania than against depression. And this makes sense because as we'll talk about next time in the psychosis lecture, psychosis is caused by dysregulated dopamine signaling. So anticonvulsant, or sorry, antipsychotic medications do directly regulate dopamine signaling. However, regulating dopamine signaling has never been proven to be the mechanism of action for these drugs. What we do know that they do from studies in cell cultures is that they prevent cell death. They prevent neurotoxicity. And as we talked about a little bit with depression, when depression is severe and recurrent, or really just when it's recurrent over two years, um, it can cause cell death. Specifically with depression, it causes cell death in the hippocampus. But severe mental illness like mania and psychosis and really severe depression can be neurotoxic. They can cause cell death throughout the brain. And one way that we think these drugs definitely work is by preventing that process. So they prevent the long-term neurodegeneration that can come with severe mental illness. Okay. There's also psychotherapy for bipolar disorder. Um, however, it, bipolar disorder is one of those conditions that needs to be managed with medication um, when you're, when a, psychologists like me is treating someone with bipolar disorder, we have to also be working with psychiatrists to manage their medication. Um, also, psychotherapy doesn't really do anything during a manic episode. You really need drugs or at least the passage of time to bring someone out of a manic episode. Fortunately though, mania does tend to be short-lived even when it's unmedicated and it's very responsive to medication. So when someone initiates treatment for bipolar disorder, say because they're hospitalized against their will or because they attempt suicide or because they do something reckless and end up in the emergency room, um, the first line of treatment is to stabilize their mood and get them out of the manic episode. The, over time, then a, a psychiatrist will work with them to find a dosage of lithium, anticonvulsants, or antipsychotics that they can tolerate side effect wise and that helps to stabilize their mood. So prevent future manic and depressive episodes. The role of a psychologist in treating bipolar disorder really comes in first with um, medication adherence. It's not first on the list, but it is really important. So as the YouTuber who filmed herself during a manic episode was saying, even though mania has a lot of downsides and it can feel really bad and scary, it also feels great a lot of the time. And a lot of people do have the misconception that mania does make them more creative or more productive. A lot of people sort of like being manic and people definitely like being hypomanic. So one reason why medication adherence can be hard is that people are often really ambivalent about taking these medications. Another reason is that they're not fun medications to take. So SSRIs are among the most widely prescribed psychiatric medications. 
and they have a really tolerable side effect profile. The main side effects are sort of physical, they cause weight gain, sexual side effects, some mild nausea and GI upset when you first start taking them, but they don't have cognitive side effects, they don't have mood side effects, except for improving your mood. Um, antipsychotics have motor side effects they, when they're not dosed properly or when someone has negative, um, a negative reaction to them. They can cause tremors and involuntary movements, which can be really, really distressing for people and also don't go away once the medication is out of their system, they're permanent. Um, they also cause metabolic effects. So they cause weight gain, but unlike antidepressants, it's not by increasing your appetite, it's by slowing down your metabolism. And in addition to causing weight gain, having a slower metabolism puts you at risk for developing um, diabetes and high blood pressure. So those are side effects of antipsychotic medications. Um, anticonvulsant medications, they can make people, and also antipsychotic medications can have some emotional side effects where people who are on them can kind of feel a little emotionally flat and a little numb. And no, you know, people don't like feeling that way. Um, although it's better than being manic or psychotic. In addition, anticonvulsant medications can make people feel a little bit less smart. They can make people feel like they're having trouble finding words. They can make them feel like they're not thinking as fast. Um, and these side effects can all be managed. And the job of a psychiatrist is to help the patient find a dose where they don't have those side effects because side effects are not normal. You don't have to live with them. You just have to find a drug that works. But that process is hard. It takes a lot of time. You do often experience a lot of nasty side effects when you're taking these drugs. Lithium, the main nasty side effect of that is that it causes like super nausea. It, it's very hard to tolerate. Um, only at first, I think people can adapt, can like adjust to it, but it's really hard to take lithium at first too. So these drugs are all difficult to take and it's really understandable that patients don't like taking them, feel ambivalent about taking them and sometimes skip taking them. So one job of a psychologist is to just work with patients to make sure that they remain motivated to take their medications and also just manage like everyday things like helping them set alarms to remember to take their medication. Even medication that doesn't have nasty side effects like birth control, you have to take it at the same time every day. A lot of people are not good at that. Same with antipsychotics and anticonvulsants. You have to take them at the same time pretty much every day. So a psychologist's job is to manage medication adherence. Also though, there are things that psychologists do that do target the symptoms of bipolar disorder from a psychological um, perspective. So one thing is symptom tracking. So helping people to become more aware of the really early warning signs of going into a manic or depressive episode so that they can take action to turn that around, whether that's going to their psychiatrist and changing their dosages or making sure that their lifestyle is on track. Because the other thing that can trigger a manic episode is altering your rhythms. So it's really important for people who are in recovery from bipolar disorder to have pretty consistent routines, but especially to get regular sleep. There is a clear relationship between sleep deprivation and mania. Um, people also need to manage their lifestyle to make sure that they're not letting themselves get too stressed out or too overstimulated, or if they are, that they have other supports in place to make sure that they don't end up um, falling into a depressive or manic episode. And part of those supports can be their family or their spouse or their friends. So therapists and psychologists really work with whoever is in the patient's life to help build their support system and help the people who are close to them also learn to recognize those early warning signs and help the patient to stay on their routine, stay in their schedule, get enough sleep, um, manage their level of stimulation and their level of goal-directed activity and stay on their medication. Okay, so I said we were going to talk about disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, but really the first question to ask is, can kids have bipolar disorder? So I don't know that I actually put this on the slide and I apologize for that, but as the textbook will tell you, um, the age of onset for mania and, de and depression both is adolescence. That's the typical average age of onset. Um, adolescence through early adulthood. It's very, 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 very rare for kids to have mania. It's also really hard to tell the difference between normal kid behavior and um, symptoms of mania and hypomania because kids are 
really elevated, really expansive, really grandiose, really irritable, way more than adults. Um, part of mania is just having kind of uncontrolled positive affect and kids are not good at controlling their affect. That's something that they're still learning. So it's difficult to diagnose mania in children. And people need a lot of training and a lot of understanding both of what mania is and what normal child development is. And unfortunately, a lot of people who make these diagnoses don't have all that training. So the other issue is that unipolar depression, um, so major depression in children can manifest itself differently than in adults. Kids might not express sadness or anhedonia. Instead, their only symptom of depression might be irritable mood. And unfortunately, irritability is a symptom of mania in adolescents and adults, but it's a symptom of depression in kids. So psychiatrists, therapists, psychologists, medical doctors who aren't well versed in child development and the DSM were basically misdi misdiagnosing irritable kids with bipolar disorder like crazy, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, because during this period, this was when the atypical antipsychotics and the anticonvulsant mood stabilizers were coming on the market and these drugs were just being developed for the first time. So someone who would be really hesitant to put a tiny little kid on lithium because the dosing of lithium is so difficult even for an adult might be more willing to put that kid on an anticonvulsant mood stabilizer. And an anticonvulsant mood stabilizer, if you prescribe it at the wrong dosages, is basically a tranquilizer. So it's not necessarily going to help the child's underlying mood dysregulation, but it will probably improve their behavior because it'll make them tired and lethargic and less annoying for their parents. So in the early 2000s, all of this kind of came to a head with two news events that happened um, in 2006 and 2007. So the first was the death of Rebecca Riley, who was a four-year-old whose parents were accused of murder because they were accused of using her psych medications to tranquilize her, basically. Um, she was prescribed anticonvulsant mood stabilizers, and she had a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. But really, her main behavioral complaint was that she was inattentive, hyperactive, and irritable. So her parents were charged with murder because they were accused of giving her overdoses of her psych medications to keep her um, lethargic and calm. So the next year, there was a huge scandal when um, a psych I think he's a psychiatrist at Harvard named Joseph Biederman was called out for not reporting conflicts of interest. He was basically getting lots of money from drug companies to promote their drugs. And the drug companies that were paying him were, drug were companies that made um, antipsychotic medications and stimulant medications. He was an expert on childhood bipolar disorder and ADHD. So it turned out that he had a conflict of interest and he had a financial motivation to promote the prescription of these drugs to children. And the best way to make sure that more children get prescribed these drugs is to write a lot of papers and give a lot of speeches saying that bipolar disorder is more common than we think in children. Turns out that it's not. Um, a recent population-based study that tried to estimate the prevalence of bipolar disorder in kids couldn't do it because it was so rare. However, all of this controversy around the overprescription of um, mood stabilizing drugs to little kids did highlight that there was a need for a diagnosis for kids who had persistently irritable mood and behavior problems. Um, more behavior problems than would be typical for depression and possibly a treatment that would specifically help these kids, a treatment other than the typical treatments that we have for depression. Also, it would be great if that treatment wasn't psychiatric medications because even though they're safe for adults, they're not really tested in kids and they can have effects on a child's development. So you have to be really thoughtful when you're prescribing any kind of psych medication to a kid, um, even an antidepressant, which is a relatively benign psych medication for an, an adult to take. Whew. Okay. So that brings us to disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. It's a unipolar disorder. It only involves negative affect. So it does not involve mania. Kids with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, DMDD, have high comorbidity with anxiety and depression, and they're likely to grow up to develop anxiety and depressive disorders. They don't grow up to have mania. It's not a bipolar disorder. So a lot of the kids who are being falsely diagnosed with bipolar disorder and overprescribed medications probably had disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. 
which is characterized by severe anger outbursts that are not proportionate to the thing that triggered them, that occur in multiple contexts, so not just with mom and dad, but also at school and with friends or with like grandparents or other family members, because kids are more likely to act out with their parents than in any of those other contexts. Um, these anger outbursts had to occur more at least three times a week and they have to be developmentally inappropriate because anger outbursts that occur three times a week are actually very development, blah, developmentally appropriate for toddlers and preschoolers, um, which is why this disorder can't be diagnosed in a child younger than six because any younger than that and this kind of behavior is actually not developmentally inappropriate. It's not abnormal. So in addition to having these anger outbursts, kids with DMDD have persistently irritable mood between mood episodes. They don't have persistently sad mood or persistently elevated mood, so it's different than depression or bipolar disorder. Um, DMDD can co-occur with depression, um, but it has to happen outside of depressive episodes. So it can't always co-occur with depressed mood because irritability, again, is a symptom of depression in kids. This irritability has to go beyond um, co-occurring depression symptoms. It can't always co-occur with low self-esteem, appetite loss, lots of sleeping, or not enough sleeping. Um, and then also it can't be diagnosed in a child who does have bipolar disorder, because as rare as it is, it is possible for kids to have bipolar disorder, just like it's possible for kids to have schizophrenia. Um, it's just extremely rare. Also, DMDD is a disorder that's limited to childhood. It can only be diagnosed based on behavior that was demonstrated between six and 18 years old. Okay, so this is a little video just describing what DMDD is like. I'm actually gonna skip it because I think it pretty much covers the ground that I covered, but when you're studying later from the slides, I recommend that you watch it. Um, Ellen Liebenluff is the head of the DMDD section at NINH. She's one of the people who helped to develop the DMDD diagnosis and get it put into DSM-5. Melissa Brotman is also part of the DMDD unit at NIMH, and her research is developing a psychotherapy treatment for DMDD. So your textbook basically says, like, hopefully one day we'll develop a treatment. Melissa Brotman is developing that treatment. Um, and the treatment combines two elements. One is parent management training, which is an evidence-based treatment for kids with behavior problems and ADHD, and exposure therapy. So the parent management training part is really just teaching parents to use positive reinforcement. So basically operant conditioning and negative reinforcement to manage their kids' behavior. So rather than waiting for them to do something bad and yelling at them or punishing them, parents in parent management training are taught to catch good behavior and reward it. So kids are more responsive to rewards than punishments. So are dogs or basically any animal that you would train using operant conditioning. When you want your dog to not pee in the house, it's more effective to praise it for peeing outside than it is to yell at it for peeing in the house. Similar to kids, when you want them to regulate their temper and be nice to other people, you wanna praise them for doing those things, not punish them for failing to. Um, so related to that, in parent management training, we advise parents to ignore bad behavior as much as possible and only step in and punish it when it passes a certain level that they clearly describe to the kid. You let kids know, like, this is the threshold for getting punished. Anything up to that threshold, I'm not going to give you any attention. Anything over that threshold, and immediate, specific, but proportional appropriate punishment. The other part of DMDD that is really unique to this disorder, um, but that's based on cognitive beha behavioral therapy principles, is exposure. So whereas we treat anxiety disorders by exposing kids to the things that make them scared and teaching them to tolerate the anxiety and sit through it instead of avoiding it. We do the same thing for anger. We expose them to the things that make them angry and irritable, and we encourage them to ride out the anger rather than getting rid of it or avoiding it by expressing it with an outburst. Um, this process involves situation and safety learning. Kids are learning what happens when they don't act on their anger, that it will peak but then start to come down, just like anxiety. And they're also learning that they are capable of doing that. They can tolerate feeling really, really angry without having an outburst or acting on it. Part of exposure therapy is also teaching kids to recognize early signs of irritability. So let make sure that they know what their triggers are, avoid those triggers when they can, um, or when they know that they're going to encounter one of those triggers to use coping skills that you've taught them. 
and you know these things these coping skills are really simple stuff like counting back from 100 clenching your fists um counting all of the orange things in the room just sort of anything to like distract your attention a little bit from the thing that's making you angry um and then also communication skills so expressing why you're irritated rather than waiting until your irritation is so intense that you have an outburst and um interpersonal effectiveness skills, which basically involve setting boundaries and telling people when they're irritating you and removing yourself from the situation if you have to. So basically it's teaching parents to manage the behavior and the negative side of anger outbursts while simultaneously teaching kids to not have those outbursts, to manage their own anger. Okay. So it's a really exciting therapy and I think it's so much better than giving kids really heavy psych medications that even adults have a hard time tolerating. Okay. Oh gosh, this was very long. Um, I think I will maybe do the suicide prevention part in a separate video and we'll just end things there with the three bipolar spectrum disorders and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Whoops. <laughs>